So a quick welcome to Brett, who's going to be our AFL analyst for 2019. We're quite excited to have Brett on board. Um, so what we thought we'd do today is just have a bit of a talk through, just quickly, obviously, who Brett is and, um, you know, a little bit about his background, and then we'll go into some details about the service for this year. Um, AFL footy is just about the most popular punting sport in Australia, so um, we're really wrapped to have Brett on board. It's a super popular package. And um, we think we're in very good hands with Brett. So, um, how are you going, Brett, just to start? Thanks for having me, Daniel. Um, let's crack on with uh, this year's presentation. It's probably the fifth or sixth one I've done so far. So, hopefully, yeah, uh, hopefully uh, the client base is uh, uh, getting used to us and uh, perhaps this is a further opportunity for existing clients and, and new clients to, to better understand um, how we have done AFL in the past and how we'll be doing it in 2019. Okay. Right. So a quick uh, recap of who we are. So we started sports betting in 2009 after six years in poker. Um, I built our first model coincidentally in, or probably not coincidentally, in AFL uh, in 2010. Uh, we've worked on our AFL solution every off-season since that year. Um, I was the first to go full-time at the start of 2013 within our um, organisation. Uh, in sports, we've settled on currently doing AFL, NRL, NBA and NFL, uh, and we're also uh, making a big push into racing for the first time. The current headcount is uh, 10 full-time personnel. And your first model being AFL, you said that wasn't quite coincidental. Is that, I guess, from a sporting point yeah. of view from when you were a young Just fella? really comes out of passion, really. I, I love the game. We're Victorian-based. So uh, the two founders, which is one, which is me, have always been uh, big big fans of the game. And there was no other, there's no other reason for getting to AFL other than loving, loving that sport over all other sports. So that was the reason why we got into that sport. Commercially, as uh, there's a certain slide that uh, is going to come up later. Commercially, in terms of uh, punting, probably not the best decision, but <laughs> it's nonetheless how we got into uh, sports modelling and sports betting. Okay, so going back to how we do things, so we have a very heavy data science-driven approach. Um, we utilise thousands of variables. Um, I have placed a huge emphasis on rock solid feature selection. Uh, and now, uh, given that I'm essentially still the head modeler, um, I have very good experience in the art of uh, tuning ML slash AI driven modeling solutions. Um, you, you're probably gonna ask me a whole bunch of questions about what parts of that statement mean. Um, mm. Let's just keep it very simple. Feature selection is the art of uh, whittling down a large data set of a large count of variables to a, a much smaller count of variables because most modeling algorithms out there cannot process thousands of variables. Um, they, can, they can process dozens, maybe up to 100. There are some techniques like deep learning, which is a form of neural net, that can process thousands of variables, but by and large, there still needs to be um, a strong emphasis within our organization anyway on rock solid feature selection which in of itself is a form uh, or is is a is to do with algo selection and use as well so there are there are certain algos that help us choose the variables that we're going to uh, use downstream in the actual modeling um, and then i also mentioned something about the art of, of tuning models or of, of actually modeling there is an art to it um, it's, it really comes from experience. You can read all the books you want, but ultimately you need to do and you need to, you know, have made a lot of mistakes uh, as we have over the last or over, over the last seven years full time, for, for me at least. And now we're at the point where I think that we have a very robust end-to-end uh, -end process. This end-to-end -end process has little to no requirement for subjectivity. Uh, any subjectivity is formalised uh, utilising methods inspired from the domain of operations research. Uh, operations research is is a sort of multidisciplinary field associated with 
effectively making good decisions from data. Um, and we, fortunately, by virtue of the people we've worked with over the years, um, we've got a little bit of insight as to uh, what OR techniques may be helpful uh, in, in sports modelling. Uh, and then there's a strong emphasis on dynamism. Uh, I've just written there, you need to adjust or perish. Um, a big part of finding value is identifying change. Uh, in my honest opinion, state change drives uh, the bulk of value creation in highly efficient sports. Um, and finally, I think that the AFL closing uh, price slash line efficiency is now very good. Uh, it's much better than it was even five years ago. Uh, you're probably going to ask me again about state change and that, that, uh, that uh, statement of uh, looking to adjust or, or perish. Um, that's exactly what I'm saying. Um, I'm, I've done this for a long time. I've done I've done a lot of uh, very efficient markets as well. Um, I've modelled main lines in the NFL, um, thrown thousands of variables against that, thrown thousands of variables against the NBA main market. Um, and let me just say, it's these markets are extremely efficient, but there are there are junctures in how the process moves through time where the most savvy players can find value yep. and so uh, how that can happen is one of two ways you either do it subjectively or you do it via you know via your quantitative techniques so um, we we have a heavy in emphasis on dynamism through formal quantitative approaches including what I just mentioned prior about the uh, operations research uh, techniques as well is there any questions at all about about that? I'll just say I'm on the right track, I guess. Um, yep. So in very basic terms, the game's always changing and the prize is there for the people who are the quickest to to recognise that change. Correct. Absolutely spot on. Absolutely spot okay. on. Good. Okay. So how do we find value in the AFL and really how do we find value in any betting market? As mentioned prior, state change uh, is very important. Uh, high quality data, unique data or proprietary data is huge. Um, you need to have a data edge in most liquid markets. Even with the AFL now, you, you need to find um, some sort of data edge. Um, and I've gone to some extreme and funny lengths to to find good quality data. Yeah, it's, it's all well and good to... I don't know, jump on footy Y or jump on AFL tables, which are um, very often quoted free sources of AFL data, but mm. that's just not enough because I know everyone else is doing it. So, you know, we've gone, I think we've gone to the next level in some ways of capturing proprietary information to maintain uh, and consolidate upon our data advantage uh, in this yep. form. Um in my opinion, team-based models don't cut it anymore in most sports, and that's including the AFL. Uh, the market has wisened up a lot uh, over the last, you know, five, ten years. Uh, market profiling is very important. Uh, market and game uh, profiling are both very important. Uh, market profiling is profiling your competition. Um, who are the competition? How do they think? And when do they execute? And that, that sort of probably needs to be explained slightly more. So that goes into how the market really works, and that's a future slide. But there are, what concerns me the most in in the AFL market is not what the public is doing. I don't care what the public is doing because they, they, are, they basically have no closing market influence. So yep. what I am trying to do is that I'm trying to figure out who has market influence, as in perhaps public providers of tips or ratings, and then uh, private uh, private players as well. So big syndicates, big players uh, who also have market influence. I'm trying to profile uh, who they are, how they think, and when they execute. So I can then come up with a game plan of what I'm going to do. Am I going to preempt some public release? Or am I going to preempt some large player that I know thinks in a certain way? Um, am I going to wait um, for a large player to enter the market first so he can help me nudge 
uh, the line two or three points before I act. Um, this 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 is an art as well. Market profiling is an art that comes back to having a very deep and intimate knowledge of how uh, how the sport works and how the market works. Unfortunately, uh, or unfortunately for me, I've spent far far too long trying to figure out the the dynamics of the AFL market at the highest level. Um, and yeah, I have a very good understanding of who's here on the zoo and yeah, how they think and, and how they execute. Um, and then next is game profiling. So um, game profiling uh, is by and large post game, is a post game action or activity. Um, yep. And for us, anyway, that, and that involves looking to adjust score lines by accounting for in game luck. There's all sorts of sources of in game luck that needs to be uh, factored in. Um, and I think this is probably something that most people don't do. Again, this is a, this is a really effort-driven process, and I, and I can see why even model players may not be able to do this because they simply don't have the time. You know, fortunately, yeah. you know, we have multiple individuals working in this organisation, so you know, if I'm not doing the post-game pro, uh, profiling, someone else is. Um, and then there's a, a, a very large quantitative component to... Um, Score on adjustment post game uh, as well. So um, yeah, there is a lot of effort going into market profiling and game profiling, and um, this is probably going into a bit about how very large syndicates work. But these profiling activities are usually done by a trader. There's a clear partition between modelers and traders in large syndicates. Fortunately for us, we're still too small. So I, I'm. I'm basically the one-man show when it comes to um, doing all the model design, model production, um, all the market-based work, as in the sorry, the trader-based work, as in the profiling, market profiling, game profiling. I I run the whole gamut of uh, uh, certain activities. So yeah, uh, hopefully I can I can I can split that out at some point in the future once we start to make more money. But right now. Yep. Um, we are the size that we are, uh, and there's a certain element of trust and experience that needs to go into modelling and needs to go into trading slash profiling. And we simply don't have other personnel that have this experience thus, uh, thus far. So um, I just need to do everything uh, at this point in time. Cool. So just just on that slide, just a couple of very quick ones. Um, you say team based models don't cut it anymore. Um, so that's, I guess, the, the first people doing models and taking AFL bidding really seriously, put together models based on the performance of teams. Um, yep. And basically that's moved towards now player-based models. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Yeah, so every, every, basically every individual player in the game, um, the, the model is based um, on that. And also, just, just to sum up again, the market profiling. So what we're basically saying there is, um, in terms of what the uh, what the the betting market's going to look like for an AFL game, um, it's effectively shaped by the big syndicates who bet into it, um, and their profiling is I guess you have to have some sort of idea how they think when they execute um, because they will move the markets and you can then use that to your advantage. Is that right? Absolutely. I I need to know or I want to know where the line or the price is going to move. And mm. if I want to know that information, I have to figure that out. And yeah. I can only figure it out if I start to profile who my competition is, how they think, and when they when they're tying their execution into the market. Yep, cool. Yeah, because you're basically, you know, I know a lot of people, um, recreational punters and, and people who look at, you know, betting more as a bit of fun. Um, you know, for them, they're taking on a bookmaker, but you know, the, the reality in a market is you're not. You're taking on the the big players who are shaping the prices. Absolutely. Correct. Yep. Correct. Sure. Okay, cracking on. Yep. So uh, next slide. Again, talking about finding value. So funnily enough, mm -hmm. I didn't have any pearls of wisdom from David Walsh up until a few weeks ago. Um, <laughs> what I'm saying is from my hard-fought experience, um, but I just happened to have a conversation with somebody a few weeks ago that talked about uh, perturbation models. Or when or basically what, what you're looking to do is not recreate the wheel and 
funnily asked the question, what should the price or line be um, in a vacuum? What you should be saying to yourself as a modeler is, when is the market wrong? Uh, yep. That's a related, a very related question to the first statement that I've just said, but um, in terms of how you model, it changes, it changes a lot, it changes everything. So um, apparently David Walsh said that first, um, and yeah, I've learned that the hard way over the last seven years, and we've come to the same conclusion. Um, you need to learn when to respect market, uh, you need to learn to lean on market intelligence, uh, and not recreate the wheel. And what we like to do is that we like to feed uh, the Thurs AFL line into our data train that gets in turn gets fed into our overall solution. So I'm effectively using market as, as a scaffold earlier in the week when I have access to a market line. And obviously you need uh, access to that same timestamp in prior years and we fortunately have been collecting um, or we've managed to extract uh, daily timestamps of uh, AFL prices and lines for the last seven or eight years now. So we have yep. the ability to, to understand where the market was at a certain point in time because we obviously cannot incorporate a line or a price when we don't have access to that line of price at a time of bet execution. So mm. what you need to do is uh, process a timestamp or a time in the past that was available to you at the time that you want to uh, create the final set of prices and lines. Uh, and so what we do is that we know that we have access to the Thursday AFL line, and so we incorporate the Thursday AFL line into our data train. Uh, the reason why we, uh, as I've written, the reason why we do that is because I'm here to beat the heart of the market. Um, I've got no interest in looking to bash up midweek lines for 200 bucks or 400 bucks. Uh, it's not where the market is. It's not how you really make money in this business um, yep. at, the, at the high levels. So I've got no interest in doing that. So um, I wait for some market activity to help shape the line. Um, and then I lean against that line. Uh, I use it as my scaffold um, and it gets ingested into our uh, all of our solutions. Mm. Uh, finally, I've written that uh, creativity is the key in all phases of model building. That absolutely is the case. Um, I've had a few conversations with people and look, to be honest, they're smart guys, but sometimes they just are not that creative. Um, yep. And my humble opinion, creativity is how you make money in adversarial uh, adversarial model building. Um, we, mm. we are in, we're in the business of essentially being adversaries against larger syndicates that also have modelers. So we effectively, uh, you know, are, are involved in competitive modeling. Uh, and so when you know that that uh, your true competition are doing exactly what you're doing, building models uh, and the like, um, you know, you, you you have to outthink them and, and outcreate them. Uh, and that's what I pride myself on. I pride myself on being very creative. Uh, and I think that's reflected in the work that I do and the margins that we hold in, in various sports. Very good. Okay, so this is a good example of finding a jet, uh, an edge through creativity. So uh, as yep. I mentioned before, team-based models don't really cut it anymore. Uh, so player importance is, or judging player influence on a game uh, and player importance in the game is, is very critical. Uh, and there are a number of ways that we've done this uh, within our AFL model. Uh, one well-worn path that, uh, given that I always research my competition as, as much as I can, whether it be, you know, free ratings providers, paid ratings providers and the like, um, I very well know that uh, there's many guys out there that uh, process super coach information uh, on all players and feed that as variables into their solution. Uh, we also do this. Um, there are other areas that are sort of proprietary to us in a way. Um, I've come up with a concept called market plus minus. It's well. similar to the concept of plus minus in various US sports. It's what's uh, it's gauging the uh, the impact of players um, when they're not in the game as compared to when they're in the game. And rather than judging it against scoreline, I actually judge it against 
uh, the uh, uh, handicap points results. So did a team cover or not cover? Did, there's, that basically can be expressed as handicap points versus the market's closing line. Um, and so what I've done is that rather than using the, the end score line, I judge it against uh, this handicap point result. And also judge it against total uh, points results versus the closing total, because I, I, I can also uh, utilise the same technique to start to judge, you know, uh, how a player can affect game pace. Um, yep. So that's that's the concept of market plus minus. We also have this concept of win shares um, for data geeks out there and sports data geeks uh, out there that have may have uh, had some experience in US sports. Win shares is something that comes out of US sports. I'd say that I only share the name uh, because I'm, I'm basically doing something very, very similar using a, an approach called structural equation modeling. Yep. Um, and yeah, I, I also, we also judge a player's total contribution to straight out wins, um, yep. handicap wins, as in did the team cover the spread or not, and then totals wins, so-called wins. So if you can, if you can define the over as a win and the under as not win, you can basically use the same the same logic to again create a, a pace share as as you could call it um, for each and every player in the game. Uh, so yeah, it's it's just another creative way of uh, getting involved with uh, player play influence and, and play importance. And finally, there's uh, public ranks and weights. Um, we we have sucked up every public rank and way that we can find, and mm -hmm. we have processed that information, and we've created a consensus blend of of weights that we then can apply to our players or to to AFL players. Um, so yeah. as I've written there, you know I've, I've used I'm still using uh, AFL coaches association votes. I used a fantastic little database. And that was um, provided by SCN Radio. They had guys um, following plays in the game and marking plays subjectively. And it was a nice little passable database that we w were consuming. Um, and we were, we were generating variables out of that information. And then there's various other Brownlow style polls as well um, that uh, is still in our consensus blend. Um, and when we combine all that information together, those four approaches, we we have a, a, a very interesting, creative, and different view of how players might impact the game as compared to, say, our competition. So yep. that's just a good example of um, how I think outside the box and um, how that relates to probably one of the most important things in uh, in AFL being markets right now, which is player informs. Sure. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. There's obviously a um, obviously a lot of debate out there about um, individual players in terms of you know um, you know how their their worth versus other players, and a lot of people find it hard to compare because you know you have got so many different positions and everything. But um, you know to to see that you actually look into it into basically what a player's input is in terms of getting a team to win or to cover the line is yeah that's really interesting yeah yeah and that's look that's that's what we need to do to, to make money really like if we don't think outside the box we just we can't maintain our advantages so I, every uh, each and every off season i go into sort of uh creative mode and i i just try and think how how can i do something differently how can i get new information or how can yep. i process the information uh, that I have in some new and different way. Yep. Um, going into how the AFL market works, how the AFL market works is, is essentially a story of how it matures uh, over the course of the week. So yep. um, some books will uh, look to release the early line and by midweek there's a copy fest going on between all the books uh, and then what happens is that this copy fest is sort of polished off by small time arbors um, that look to sort of uh, maintain the harmony of the early um, Tuesday, Wednesday line. Um, I've written there, books don't know and don't care what the, what the true line is. Um, that's really true. Um, yep. Lines makers or market majors these days are not, are not interested and really have, don't have the capability 
or the interest in trying to set an, an, an accurate price or line. Um, what they do is that they will open up and then they will start to look for a signal from either a smarter book or a signal from a sharp player uh, in their own client base to begin to understand um, how to uh, move the line to price efficiency. Yep. So um, once all the copying is done and once once the arbiters have basically finished off um, trying to sort of polish off the point or two that some odd book might be out, we have the early line. And then what happens is that small, uh, small sharp players will start to enter the market and start to nibble at, at these prices, uh, bringing them uh, ever closer to efficiency. Um, once uh, Thursday night AFL team leads get released, there's a sort of a mini frenzy as, as small model players uh, enter and, and uh, spot players as, as well um, into the market. Uh, as they are keen to sort of make the most of their size and and not have to get uh, or deal with the, the price of line being crunched by uh, larger players downstream. So people with uh, smaller amounts of working capital all come in early so they can get their uh, get their feet. Uh, yeah. And then basically what's happening is that big, big players are still keeping their hands themselves uh, and basically cop these early moves on the chin as they're looking to wait for the market to become more liquid before they uh, act. And then finally, uh, on game day, then hours hour, and then uh, after final team lists have, have come out, big players will start to enter the market. They'll hit books, they take action. They'll maybe hit, uh, hit, hit up the terminals as well. They'll, they'll market make on Betfair and Matchbook. Uh, and they will even look for dark pool liquidity as well. Um, there's probably a few terms in there that um, need some explanation. Ma market making is the act of looking to foster action on an exchange. So uh, take for example, I need to market make to get on what I want on AFL totals. So I'll sit there on game day and I will, I will carry action. I will, I will encourage action. I will drip feed my, what I want into the market as to not spook market um, and I'll, I'll play all sorts of games to try and convince somebody to match me. Um, I'm also looking for and given again my exposure to how, how it all works, you know, I'm, I'm looking for certain characteristics of market to, to try and understand whether that action sitting right beside me uh, is maybe a bookie trying to lay off or sharp, sharp action that has a different opinion on the game to me. So uh, there's all sorts of things or there's all sorts of considerations uh, linked to market making. I would also say that's a form of art as well that takes years to do right. Um, and that would also fall on the umbrella of trading or what, what the trader's role is in a large syndicate. But again, I, I have to do everything. So I also market make. Uh, and then finally, I also mentioned dark pool action. Um, mm. there, are, there, there are players in this country and there are, there are players around the world, very large players around the world that um, want more action than what overt um, streams can give them. So yep. there is a dark pool market, you could say, where there's private layers that will uh, link themselves to some, what, what they infer to be a sharp line or sharp price and they will offer, offer larger limits privately to large players because they yep. have confidence in some sharp price of line that, that may be out there. So that's also going on with AFL football at the very highest level. Mm. Uh, and then finally I've written that 99.9% .9 of all market participants are price takers. The closing price in most games is dictated by the interplay of a few large players slash betting syndicate. That's true in, I think, most, uh, most sports. You've got I would I would say that there's maybe no more than ten players in uh, in this country that have a closing market influence in uh, uh, in the AFL market. Um, mm. I'd say that our release once we start releasing would be one of them. Um, and there are other um, uh, there, are, there are other sports tipping services out there that um, will release on AFL football that. Um, that the market respects and they will also move the line. Uh, and then there's finally there's some very large players uh, who also take AFL seriously 
Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say there's a and actually this, this comes on a, a future slide, but I would I would argue that there is not a single um, AFL only betting syndicate or full time AFL betting syndicate in this country. It just it's not yeah. possible, um, mm. and I'll explain that later on. But there are there are international syndicates punning AFL football. Um, I know this for a fact. Um, yeah, I've been sure. over the UK. Um, I've spoken about this kind of stuff to some very large uh, outfits. Um, maybe I had some influence in bringing some of these players uh, into this country. But there is definitely trading desks um, offshore that um, are now saying to uh, do some uh, punning on on uh, these these sports here in Australia. And yeah, I would say that the AFL uh, is of is of interest to them. It was of a lot yep. of interest to them in 2016 when Pinnacle went nuts with um, with uh, the the market limits on AFL football. Yep. Um, that, the market itself changed when uh, Penny left. Penny left the uh, left his country and left AFL. Uh, yep. Those limits basically crashed overnight. Uh, and what seems to have happened over the last couple of years is that you've got players like well, not players, but you've got a, a book like Top Sport. And exchanges like Betfair that have taken up the slack. But I can definitely yeah. see there's a lot of uh, action going on late that's, I look, in, in my opinion, is just not coming from this country. It's coming from offshore. Right. And just on uh, that, that's, um, that is something that um, you know has has changed in the last um, couple of years, as you said. People no longer being able to bet with Pinnacle. Um, so, in your opinion, there's still um, there's still other operators who, who have taken up the slack and were, was, should still be able to get good size bets on? Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. I've, I've bet large amounts of top sport. Um, I've bet large amounts of Betfair. Uh, yep. And so that's that's essentially where I get my action. Cool, great. Yeah. Okay, so going on, I think of the last point years that uh, TV reports about whether punting public's uh, uh, funds go is, is by and large bullshit. Um, corporate bookmakers are not uh, uh, price makers. They are price. They are basically price takers as well because they aren't in the business of you know uh, high turnover, uh, low, low margins that taking on sharp plays kind of involves. They're in the business of profiling mugs and taking money from mugs. So um, they will. Basically, anchor themselves to uh, where they believe the sharp action is at. Um, mm. And you know, when Solo comes on TV and talks about what Sportsbet is doing or whatever, um, mm. it's just it's just them copying uh, other sources of, of sharp action. Yeah, they're not uh, they're not bookmakers, basically corporate bookmakers. Uh, yes, yeah, they're a big. Mar they're basically a marking operation. Exactly. Yeah. Hey. Okay. So how are we going to advise this year? Um, yep. In my opinion, uh, the line moved too far of champion April releases in prior seasons. Um, there was there was a like a first move that was linked to the first part of the client base uh, getting on, and then there were definitely there were definitely bookies on the feet, um, and then I would say that certain bookies were overreacting to that to that release, and then yep. finally, there's no doubt about this. There would have been some sort of word of mouth circulation from the client base to mates outside the client base, um, yep. and the line just kept on moving. Um, I saw I saw line moves of six, seven, eight, ten points uh, after the first release, and that's just crazy. Um, yeah. I can guarantee you that the last three or four points was definitely not making money. Um, and yeah. so, what we need to ensure is that we have a firm guidance as to uh, when the client base stops buying because we don't want the client base. We, we, we don't want people that may be slow on the uptake of the release to, you know, buy four points worse if it's a line bet or five points worse, which is just horrendous. Um, yep. So we need to we need to control how we release and we need to advise um, when to stop buying. Mm -hmm. uh, if the line moves too far anyway after our release, um, we will advise to close out. Um, that advice is basically built into where we tell you to stop buying. But if we feel that the line keeps on moving, we will explicitly 
send out a new message saying it's time to close out here and it's, to, it's sure. time to buy on, on the other side, uh, which, which happens, you know. I've, I've opened up some position, um, I, uh, generally with the intent of closing off uh, because I had the expectation that the, the market would, would move a certain way. Uh, well, I moved six points, seven points, so I, I close off and start to middle my first position and then I buy on top and actually actually uh, go at risk again, but now yep. on the other side. Um, yeah, sure. So that's, that's something that um, we'll look to do um, in a very simple way. I won't, I won't, what, what I do personally, what we do personally is very active and I'll try to curtail most of the intense activity in, in, in terms of trying to, uh, trying to manage our own, uh, our own trading position by, you know, giving you much simpler instructions in, in terms of how to maintain um, our client's position. Mm. And finally, uh, in play. Uh, I'm, I'm looking, well, I, I got seriously involved in, in play trading of uh, the AFL last season uh, and it was very, I think it's very lucrative. Um, I think that the in play price, it is pretty dumb. However, there's an issue and the issue is that it's not that liquid. So yep. um, from my experience, I, I, I sort of taught myself about how, how the in-play market works over the course of the season. You know, I, I created strategies and built, built solutions um, that was sort of more in tune with if the market was more liquid. So I, I had to sort of change the way I traded. Uh, but what, uh, how this pertains to the AFL, uh, to the champion client base, is that um, there are certain opportunities inside the game, most often at half time where the market is most liquid um, and there, there's actually time to get on. So um, I would be, like, I, I won't be releasing positions where, where I'm like, trying to build some position by laying 101 or 102, like, which is actually quite lucrative last year at certain points in the game, uh, mm. given some huge comebacks, and which we pocketed quite well. But I can't exactly share that kind of betting Signal with our client base, given that there's not much money in the uh, in the in-play market on Betfair. So, what I'll look to do is I'll look to isolate um, in-play trades to half-time, perhaps even quarter-time breaks as well. But by and large, I'll I'll, I'll be looking to uh, open up at half-time and uh, tra transmitting that that uh, that trading signal to our client base. Um, it will generally be. I will not release anything at halftime that's linked to closing a pre-game position because I think that's that's quite unfair um, yep. on on clients that may not be able to um, close off their existing position. But what I'll do is open up new positions at, at half times on, on games that we may not have had an interest in pre-game. Sure. Okay. Why are we doing this if we're so good? Um, it's been asked in the past and I think uh, it's a very, very good question and uh, I think it's it's time to answer it again and maybe this time in, in more detail. Um, yeah. If I had my time again, I would never have done AFL football. I've spent far too much time trying to model AFL football um, and given what I know about how punting really works at the highest level, um, you know, seven, seven years full time plus the years prior to that, concentrating on a, on a small Australian sport with a, two, a very short 200 game season um, leads to high concentration risk uh, uh, trading from season to season. Uh, and from a business risk perspective, uh, that's for me, uh, in my experience, it's been extremely hard to manage um, paying the bills and building a trading business um, when I was exposed to 200 games a year. So that's the biggest lesson that I've learned, um, trying to build mm -hmm. a uh, trading syndicate, a sports trading syndicate over, over the last two or three years. Punding is a business just like any other business and I need to manage various risks of the business. Um, and so being exposed to one one single sport and 200 games is just not what I want to do. So I need to try and diversify my risk. Getting tipping revenue is definitely one of them and doing other sports is definitely what we've had to do to um, you know, years ago, stay alive and, and now try and prosper and actually 
move up the food chain in, uh, in terms of where we sit in the market. Uh, and so, yeah, in, in my in my uh, humble opinion, there is no single AFL full-time business uh, syndicate in this country. Um, I've looked far and wide. I've contacted or well, I've got contacts with many big players in this country and offshore mm. and not a single large syndicate, including ourselves, does AFL by itself. It's impossible. Yep. Uh, in, yep. in my opinion, it's just impossible. If you think you're a budding full-time AFL betting syndicate, I wish you the best of luck because you will need it. Because there will be there will be times that there, there, there will be seasons where you'll have lean years at a pure variance, and you'll have to cope with trying to manage business over perhaps multiple years um, where variance has has hit your bottom line, uh, and you're still trying to figure out how to stay alive. So mm. that's what I've learned um, uh, trying to model a short season sports. Uh, and that's a, that's a really big reason why uh, we've looked to diversify into US sports with uh, much longer seasons and now into racing, which you know has tens of thousands of races uh, a year all around the world. So that's the reason why we're doing what we're doing uh, with AFL football and uh, yeah, uh, handing our tips out to the to the betting public. Glad you've um, uh, glad, glad you've spent too much time on it because that's seven years of research yeah, that um, helps, unfortunately you've had to put in, but that, it helps us. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah like I, I would say that yeah, absolutely exploit the amount of time and effort we have put in to our mm. solutions over the last uh, seven years. Mm. Okay, so we're now going to crack into uh, a showcase of some of our capabilities. So, yeah, if you just uh, give us a bit of an uh, idea former, of some of the stuff you look at. Former AFL Platinum clients would have seen uh, seen some of the outputs on, on this sheet. Um, we had an AFL Platinum package, a so-called Platinum package in 2017 that I think it pumped out about 3,500 bets or 3,000 bets. And we held about 7 or 8% margins throughout the course of that season. We, we intended yep. to start off with it again in 2018 and we, in fact, had a small platinum client base, but uh, I then decided that just wasn't worth the time and the effort. Um, but there is certainly members of our of, of the champion client base that know that have seen this file um, and have had exposure to these capabilities in the past. Um, yep. It will it will happen again. Um, I was speaking to Dave about our, our capability and how our capability is growing. Um, we're looking to fully automate uh, the identification of bets and sport basically uh, with with smaller markets i.e prop bets um, we've we've done that with basketball and we'll be doing that uh, with with both the afl and, and league and so there will come a point at some point uh, in this season where we'll be able to automate the uh the tip generation of you know hundreds of bets um and once that capability comes online uh, i'll have discussion with dave as to what we can perhaps do with that, but it just goes to show that you know we aren't two big players. Um, you know, I, I I have an offshore IT team that you know I'm spending currently spending twenty five thousand a month offshore building building trading platforms and maintaining uh, capabilities uh, with 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 automation uh, in support. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm looking to expand on that. And there's definitely some opportunity there for for champion clients in being exposed to that to that capability. Um, but going into what it actually is, uh, you can see here that we we model the metrics of every single player. Yep. Um, so there's what there's there's 12, 13 uh, metrics here that, that we've uh, that we've modeled. Uh, and so we basically process the team list. We have uh, player model solutions. Uh, in, in fact, we actually have separate models for separate metrics, and then inside that metric, we have multiple models. So we have 12 player kick models, we have 12 player handball models, we have 12 player mark models, and then so on and so forth. That's how how much effort we have put into this. Um, this is probably a, a tab that the client, uh, former clients, may have not seen. Um, this is our uh, this is our in play trading tab. So this literally gets printed out uh, each and every week. Uh, as you can see, we've got certain in-game 
trading signals and then we've got a, a trading plan as well that we all print out. Um, and yeah, I, I basically will look at my signals, I look at the game script, look at, you know, there's, uh, there's red time signals, there's uh, gold, gold momentum signals for, for both teams, uh, there's lead change uh, trading signals. So we've basically modelled, we've got 12 different models which I applied against uh, lead change count in, in prior games. So what I'm looking to do is try and understand whether it will be a contrar uh, uh, contrarian game where the market will swing back and forth given that the game will swing back and forth or whether it's a uh, momentum game where some, some, uh, some team takes a lead and then holds that lead. So um, what, what, what I'm looking to do is always in play. I'm trying to figure out whether that game, that team that's in the lead has momentum and should I bet with momentum or should I go contrary to who's leading uh, and, and, and buy the other team. So I've created a whole bunch of trading uh, signals linked to that uh, and that's, that basically lives in this in-play trading sheet um, that, that we print out. Um, we have a – we have – uh, projected box scores again. Every single metric, every single metric to, uh, game metric is modelled at the team level and also modelled at the player level. Um, we've got game scripts, so I've got I've got models. With, uh, we have models for every quarter. So and mm. so not only do we have models for every quarter, but we have two sets of models for every quarter. We have uh, a set of models. We have twelve models looking at game supremacy, i.e. Who's going to lead in that quarter, or, or who's going to, yeah, basically, you know, uh, make the margin in, uh, in that quarter, uh, and mm. then what is the game pace, or what, how many total match points should we expect in that quarter? So there's two sets of twelve for for, uh, for each and every quarter. Um, so hopefully you can appreciate that it's kind of like it's kind of like uh, trying to weave a blanket. You know, I've got all these little threads coming in. And there's, yeah. there's actually hundreds of threads uh, being threaded together to form an overall game view. And then what we do is that we trade on that game view, whether it be trading on that game view pre-game or in-game. Um, we we are trading on this game view that, that, that we've built through hundreds of models that are woven together. There's so much, uh, so much in there. The, uh, the games where you absolutely nail it must be pretty satisfying. Absolutely, absolutely. There's uh, those two games that, that stick in my mind last last year. Uh, we had a signal to it was it was St Kilda versus Melbourne, and, mm. and we had a signal to buy to buy the uh, the opposing team when Melbourne scored three goals straight. If they scored three goals straight in the first quarter, and guess what? Mm. They took a quick lead in the first quarter uh, against St Kilda, and I jumped in and I, I started laying uh, Melbourne at at uh, 101 and I uh, yep. built a position which ended up paying $25,000 on that game and that, that happened twice uh, over the course of last season. I, I, I went contrarian against against Melbourne early in the game. I also yep. went contrarian against Sydney when Gold Coast bet them and I also, again, lay 101, 103, 105 uh, and built a position that uh, in that game and also uh, also where we picked up about 25000 So. Yeah. Um, that's the kind of things that I'm doing in game. I, I, I can't, I can't share that with the client base because like they're simply, it's simply not the market isn't like doesn't have enough volume in order for us to do that. But it just yeah. goes to show what I'm doing with these trading signals. I'm, I'm looking to like uh, take for example here. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what happened in this game. Um, I think Richmond ended up killing him in this game, but um, mm. it was telling me here that. Uh, I should have backed Adelaide if Adelaide got a run on um, in the later stages of the game. Uh, and mm. also it was telling me here that if if the Tigers got a run on, you know, scoring two or three goals, if they started stringing goals together, I should bet with momentum. Um, so, yeah, that's that's how we trade it in play. There's also pre-game use to in-play trading signals because it, makes, it helps, me, helps me better understand whether – uh, this game could be fat tail or not, i.e., um, if the standard, if the if the possible standard deviation of this game um, could take the game into into regions of sort of uh, margin possibility that might be conducive to uh, 
uh, you know, buying at long odds prior to the game, i.e., you know, punting, punting Tigers 70 plus uh, pre game, yeah. you know, $12 yeah. or something. Um, these in play signals actually help me to do that. There was, there yep. was one game, uh, there was, there was, no, it was this game, was this game, Richmond Adelaide. This, this was in, uh, this was in NT, I think. Um, yep. Or was it Melbourne Adelaide? I think it was Melbourne Adelaide, uh, up in NT. Uh, and I had signals for both sides. Uh, the the the, the in-play trading signals were, were telling me to that the game could easily spiral out of control, and that either side could have racked up a very large margin. And it just mm. it just went. Uh, it just it just so happened to be that Melbourne ended up, I think, killing them by about 60, 70, 80 points. And the the pre-game line was like, I'm pretty sure the pre-game line was something like Melbourne minus six and a half, minus seven and a half. Yep. Um, and they ended up winning by 60, 70 points. And I had signals on both teams saying, you know, if there's, um, if if the Ds are up, uh, if, if, if they've kicked three goals straight, keep buying, keep buying, keep buying. So I'm like, okay, well, if that is going to happen, how can I exploit this pregame? So I, I bought both sides. At, at uh, long odds, and I managed to yeah, pocket pocket the D's at like uh, sevens or eights or even tens. But yeah, like that's that's the kind of um, that's the kind of advantages that you can get from in-play trading signals pre-game. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I no, them again this season, um, and they will probably end up settling in the AFL. Um, there's a there's there's two packages. There's the main line package and then the, the AFL specials package. We'll we'll probably end up having those kinds of bets pre-game and and plonking that in uh, into the other package rather than this main market package. But hopefully you've got some sort of um, a, a good appreciation of how this this uh, this can sort of work for us pre-game. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then yeah, like you can, we can just scroll here. I've got you know I've got pricing mechanisms for you know uh, binary player props, player versus player. I can I can price groups. Um, I can price first and last goal scorers. Um, yep. I can price anything on the uh, on any tab market that's there. I, I can price it. Um, I can price everything. I, we can price everything in in this sport. Um, mm. Yeah, so it just goes to show how much effort we've put into uh, into AFL football. Yeah, it's a really good. Uh, I think yeah, and, you know the whole the whole webinar, everything we've gone through. It's for people who are you know having a bet on AFL and perhaps looking to get a little bit more serious. It's a really good eye opener into both the market in terms of what's out there and you know what you're really taking on if you want to be successful, and also you know what what is required to do that. What actually goes into it. It's um, as I said, it's a, it's a real eye opener. It's huge. Awesome. No worries. Well, that's that's it for me, mate. I've, I've got I've got nothing else that uh, I can I can share. Um, yeah, no, I hope really that, uh, people listening have got a, a great understanding of you know the effort that uh, is needed to make money in in punting at the highest level. Sure. Yeah, no, that's great. So uh, thanks for your time today. We um, yeah, we really appreciate it. If anyone's got any. Uh, any questions or anything, just uh, just shoot them into the team on the website or via email or phone by the usual avenues, and we'll uh, we'll endeavour to get them answered. Um, and of course, all the details of the the AFL package for this year up on the website. Getting quickly, um, as I said at the start, it's probably their most popular punting sport in Australia, and the, the this these services are always sell out really quickly. So um, yeah, we do have to obviously put a bit of a cap on it for. Um, the purposes of protecting dividends to a certain degree. So, um, yeah, if you just head to championbets.com.au and, um, yeah, we're we'll, looking forward to a, a big year on the punt and the footy. So thanks for your time, Brett. Cheers, mate. Thank you.